It's been a while, well, 13 months to be precise, since the last video of this series was uploaded. The future of this car has kind of always been up in the air one way or another, and the progress of this series has been, well, slow. And since it's been so long since the last episode, we'll go through a quick recap. Sean was given the car by a co-worker after it had been sitting for a few years. We towed it from Maryland to West Virginia and let it sit there a while while we figured out what we wanted to do with it. While there, we bypassed the neutral safety switch, replaced the fuel pump and the oil, and a few small odds and ends. When we first started the Jeep, the accessory drive was locked up, but it freed itself pretty quickly. It seemed to drive pretty well, and Rob fell in love with it, so Sean sold it to him. Eventually, Rob put plates on it and drove it back to his house at the edge of Maryland. From there, he drove it for a short while before it stranded him on the highway. He had it towed over, and we replaced the ignition coil and then the crankshaft position sensor. It started right up, and everything appeared to work fine at least for a little while. Then, occasionally, the Jeep started having issues at higher RPMs, and it developed a pretty bad stumble. It seemed like it would only start to occur after running for a while when things were starting to warm up. He replaced the fuel filter, and after a lot of users suggested that the parts store crank sensors are no good, installed a Mopar one. But still no dice. And that's about as far as things got. We're picking this up in February of this year, when Sean and I first went over and the three of us tried to diagnose it. And the first problem we encountered upon getting to the Jeep is that the battery was stone cold dead. Well, make sure the battery's not dead, just put it in start so we can OBD2 look at it. Any lights? A light? <laughs> uh oh. Just the one side. <laughs> I don't know why it would do that. What if we leave the snow on there and then the hood won't fly open on the highway? <laughs> Come on, let's <laughs> just, hey, just close we didn't, that. Don't, we didn't exactly do a cool one. Don't look at that. <laughs> and every time it sits for a couple of days, the alternator locks up, and guess what? It's been sitting. If you let it sit for too long, it locks up. If you're driving it every day, it's fine. It's I'm too lazy for that. Yeah, I the belt is all, the belt is messed up anyway. <laughs> I, don't know. I would just Jeez. start it and then. Maybe add a little extra tension to the, <laughs> to the tensioner there. <laughs> it's pretty crusty looking. No. Oh, uh, what, just, what just happened there? Nothing happened. <laughs> I was just seeing it, it moves a little bit. So yeah. It's fine. It's, it's fine. It's fine. It's fine. Oh my god. It's well, just, it's not going to go anywhere. Uh, just take it off. It's going to hit the fan yeah, and just, kill everyone now. I think it part of that is because it's, it's so cold well, outside. Yeah, definitely because it's so cold outside. Uh huh. Well, it's got half a shroud. Not for long. <laughs> Stop! It's pretty tight in there. I say just start it. But what is Sean doing? We couldn't spin the alternator by hand, certainly not with the belt on there, so we were trying to turn it with a ratchet to break it loose. And we decided to move the jimmy to get a little bit more room. It was cold enough out that nothing really wanted to start. <laughs> no. Oh! There you go. Wow. We left that running to charge, which is why you'll hear it in the background. But we turned our attention back to the Jeep and put a jump starter on it to get it going. <laughs> don't, don't touch it! <laughs> but the accessory drive was quite locked up and the belt was slipping on the crank pulley. Oh, there it goes. <laughs> in order to free up the alternator, I rolled under the Jeep with a ratchet and started turning it. It took a lot of force to get it moving at first, but then it did loosen up. It's turning the crank. <laughs> what? It's yeah, the crank is turning. Everything's turning. Okay. Yeah, I mean everything's turning now. And despite all the times it slipped, that belt is still holding on pretty well. And now for a jump start, take two. Go, 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 go. Ah, it really wants to. It's really trying hard. Oh, yeah. Oh, it's trying so hard. So, yeah, that wasn't working. It's trying so hard. <laughs> it's so sad. Yeah. Yeah, you can smell it. Now the drive system was moving a tiny bit, but still severely slipping on the crank pulley. 
The belt's not new, but it's also not in terrible shape, and there's definitely enough tension on it, so it should be able to get everything turning. But there's just so much resistance in the drive system that it doesn't have enough grip to spin everything. Even though the tension seemed correct, we went ahead and added a little bit just in case that would be enough to help. But that wasn't enough. We decided to take some tension off the belt in the hopes that that would let us spin the alternator much more easily. With the belt on, since it was spinning everything, it was taking a lot of force. And making it difficult to really turn the thing by hand and hopefully free it up. And once the belt was off, I spent quite a while turning the alternator in both directions trying to loosen it up. And while it never actually loosened up, it was still pretty tight by the end, it did get a little easier to turn. So we put the belt back on, reapplied tension, and tried again. There's no footage of any of this because this is what happens when I hand shone the camera. Unusable footage. No idea if it's focusing. It doesn't look out of focus. No. None of this is usable footage. Anyway, we started it up again, and still no change. While turning the alternator, most of it's tight, and there is a loose spot, which you can see here as it kind of jumps forward every once in a while. But it's just not working, and it's going to burn the rubber off of the belt. And the cold sure isn't helping anything. It's worth noting that, with the battery completely dead, and the alternator sure not generating any current, it was running off of that jump pack this whole time. That's... pretty impressive, really. With that jump pack still connected, I hooked up a scan tool to try to get some readings and maybe get an idea of what the actual running problem is, other than the alternator being locked up. But the computer was being a little weird and was difficult to connect to, probably because of the battery situation. I did eventually get far enough in to see what the check engine light was on for, but it wasn't anything surprising. The neutral safety switch is just bypassed at the connector, so it knows something is going on there, and the gas gauge straight up doesn't work, so it's no surprise that it has an issue with that too. We couldn't really leave it running, certainly not for long, so we tried to check as many things as we could while we were there. We were able to look at the throttle position sensor, and by manually operating it, confirmed that, at least sitting here, the readings are accurate and unfortunately we weren't able to get the scanner to really read anything while the jeep was running, so we went ahead and called it a day. It's an uneventful day, but at least we get that, that sweet rubber smell. Just, just like being at the drag strip, you know? Blah. And that was pretty much all I saw of the jeep until May when I went back up to look at it. And at this point, after Rob turned it over some more, and probably thanks to the warmer weather, the alternator was spinning again. So, for the first time in a long time, I was able to hear the Jeep running properly. I hooked up the scan tool and started to run through data when we realized gas was pouring out the bottom of the Jeep. Rob had installed this filter a few months ago, and it had been on and off since then, so between that and the change in temperature, those worm gear hose clamps ended up being a little too loose. Just for kicks, to check it for myself, I decided to remove it and see how much resistance there was blowing through it, in case it had gotten clogged again since being installed. After all, the gas tank seemed to be kinda nasty. We removed the clamp holding the body of the filter and disconnected the two hoses. There is a small amount of resistance blowing through the filter element, but nothing too out of the ordinary. It does not appear to be clogged. So we went ahead and reinstalled it, and doubled up on the hose clamps this time, making sure they were tight enough and we wouldn't have any more leaks. And now that we had it running, and not leaking, I ran through the data on the scan tool and didn't really see anything out of the ordinary. So at least when it was sitting here idling, there didn't seem to be anything wrong. I had brought a fuel pressure gauge to try attaching that to the engine, but the o-ring and the adapter did not agree with the Schrader valve, and we weren't able to use it without gas spraying everywhere. So we still weren't able to diagnose the problem, and the alternator is currently spinning, but it will definitely be a problem again in the future. And at this point, Rob needed the Jeep to be moved yet again. Rob decided great. he was feeling brave. No, this drive's gonna be miserable. <laughs> so we went ahead and hit the road for the approximately hour-long drive to get the Jeep back. 
I let Rob lead the way, and I followed in the 91 Firebird. We elected to skip out on highway driving at first, since the Jeep mostly had issues at higher RPMs. But it seemed to be driving really well, almost without issue, so we ended up taking the highway part way. And surprisingly, the drive was, well, uneventful. So once again, we had successfully moved the Jeep, without actually fixing it, and now it wasn't located quite so far away, so it was a lot easier for Rob to drive it around. And for a while, he did drive it around. It still had that stumble at higher RPMs, and it kinda seemed like it was getting worse. It would occur sooner during a drive, and lower in the engine speed range. But he had to stop driving it again, when the alternator once again locked up. But this time we were a little bit more prepared for it, because back in March, Sean and I had been at a junkyard for a different reason, and came across this 1994 Jeep Cherokee. It appeared to be in decent shape, so we went ahead and pulled the alternator out of it. It was cheap, the alternator spun freely, and at the very least it was in much better shape than the one in Rob's Jeep. And once his alternator had locked up again, it seemed like it was time to go ahead and install the new one. Well, the better one, at least. It's not the easiest alternator to get to, but at least it's not the most difficult. But everything sure is crusty. There's a lot of crust, you'd have to be more specific, but... Yeah, and just in like the month that it's been sitting since it like really locked up. So how hard is it to turn that right now? Uh, you can still do it with like one hand, it's just uncomfortable. You wanna put the electric ratchet on there and see if it'll do it? Before removing it, we tried to see if we could spin everything with the electric ratchet, although it proved to be a little trickier than anticipated. It's so convenient. <laughs> this is the best because I can see it perfectly. Oh! Oh! Now it's gonna not do anything. Nope. <laughs> not a goddamn thing. Nope. All right. All you gotta do, take a big old auger, or just jam something through there, and then put the impact gun on it. Loosen that right up. And we decided to give up on that and go ahead and remove the old alternator. The first thing we'll do is disconnect the battery. Partially because we're going to be working with cables that are probably live, and also partially because the battery has to be removed to get down to the alternator. And in order to make things easier, we'll also remove the battery tray. I'm not sure it's entirely necessary, but it does make it easier to get down into the engine bay. At the bottom of the tray is a battery temperature sensor, so we want to make sure not to mess that up. There are three nuts at the bottom of the battery tray that hold it down. Battery tray is full of West Virginia. There's a big spider down there. Oh shit. Hold on, I'll pull this hose off real quick. <laughs> they were so rusted and dirty that it was pretty difficult to get a socket on them, but eventually we did remove them all. <laughs> Easy. Easy piece. Trust removal not necessary. Mm. Why does everything have to be such a chore? <laughs> oh, oh. Hey. And eventually we were able to lift out the tray. What oh. everything coming off. Then we'll disconnect that sensor and set the whole thing aside. <laughs> Man, I am not good with connectors. <laughs> that thing is pretty elaborate. No. Hey! Okay. Carefully go throw this into dump the, ocean. the garbage. This, ooh, 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 that's bad. <laughs> oh man. Yeah, just don't, don't rub any more rust off of there and it should sit just fine. Okay, good. And the next thing we have to do is get the serpentine belt off of the pulley and out of the way. To do that, we need to release tension on the belt. This Jeep applies tension with this pulley down below the power steering pump. First, we need to snake a wrench into there and loosen up the bolt. We had done this last time we adjusted the belt tension, so it wasn't too stuck in place, but it sure isn't easy to get to. Removing the AC fan would make it easier, but then you also have to remove the fan. So we'll loosen that up just a touch, and then we'll turn the adjuster bolt. This is the bolt that actually sets the position of the tensioner pulley, and it's how you set the amount of tension. The bolt at the center of the pulley just locks things down. So we'll loosen it up until we can slide the belt off the tensioner pulley and remove it. At least enough to get it out of the way. 
Most vehicles will have a sticker showing the routing of the belt, but you can't always rely on it, so it's a good idea to take a picture of how the belt is routed or just be very sure you understand it before removing it. And only take it as far off as you need to. And with the belt off of the alternator, we just need to unbolt it and remove the wire. It's one bolt up top, there's two bolts down at the bottom, and this is probably a 10 millimeter nut holding that wire on. First, we'll roll underneath and remove the first bolt holding the bottom of the alternator. Damn it. And you actually probably don't need to remove this second bolt, but I think it makes it easier to slide it out of place. The first bolt was the one actually holding in the alternator, but the second one is also clamping down on the bracket holding the front of it. So removing it will give us a little bit more wiggle room, which I think we're going to need a lot of. And the top is held in with a through bolt and a nut. We loosened this up with the breaker bar and then completely removed it. What I thought. Now there's just corrosion holding it in. Okay, good. All the bolts are out. We also removed the 10 millimeter nut from the back, holding on the main feed wire. We knew there were more wires to deal with, but we couldn't quite see the back of it, so we decided to slide it off of its mounts and rotate it around. I did it. I did it. Oh, I almost did it. You got it. Oh, you weren't wrong when you said corrosion was holding it in. Oh, it's unhooked. Now you just gotta get it out. Um, this was the hard part. Yeah. On the I... last one. We also determined that the alternator did not seem like it would come out of there with the main clutch fan installed. The junkyard jeep that we removed the alternator from was kind of already in pieces and we did it pretty quick so I couldn't remember exactly what we had to go through to retrieve the alternator. So let's go ahead and get out that alternator and take a look at it. First off, the bearing in this one seems much better. There's a little bit of squeaking, but that's totally normal for the brushes inside of one of these. This little black plastic part is the voltage regulator. We couldn't quite figure out how to get the whole thing out of there, so at the junkyard we just hacked through the wires with a knife. Unless we're missing something, there doesn't appear to be an easy way to remove the voltage regulator from the wiring harness, so we'll go ahead and remove the hacked up voltage regulator from the junkyard alternator before unbolting the regulator from our Jeep's alternator and just switching the regulator over. Whenever things were actually turning, the charging system was working, so there's no reason to believe there's anything wrong other than the internal rotating assembly of the alternator itself. There are four studs and four small nuts holding the regulator and its connections to the back of the alternator. One of the larger ones is a mount for the regulator and the other is a housing ground. And the other two are the electrical terminals feeding the regulator. And now that the junkyard alternator is ready and we have a little practice, now we get to do the same thing within the confines of the engine bay. And it was definitely not easy, but eventually we did manage to separate the regulator from this alternator. And with it totally disconnected, we can try once more to remove it from the engine bay. But something definitely has to be moved out of the way, and it seems like the easiest thing, or at least the largest, is that big cooling clutch fan. That's what we did at the junkyard, and it ended up working out. It's very close, very frustratingly close, but it needs a little bit more work. So we'll go ahead and remove the fan. It's held onto the water pump with four nuts. The trick is, of course the whole thing is going to want to rotate when you try to loosen those. All we're doing to hold it still is using a large flathead screwdriver jammed between one of the studs and the central shaft of the fan to hold it still. We'll spin it around and loosen all four of them up, and then completely remove them. And once that fourth one is off of there, so is the fan. Luckily, smartly, Rob has already modified the radiator fan shroud to make this removal easier. Then all we have to do is grab the alternator, and it lifts right out. And now we can finally put the two side by side, and big sigh of relief, they are actually the same. And with a better view of it, we can see what the issue probably is. The housing is cracked, which has caused it to warp out of shape, and it's definitely not helping the thing turn, at least. That alternator also just looks significantly <laughs> more corroded. <laughs> yeah, I think this is just salt. Not that bad. Look! <laughs> Anybody need an alternator? You can put it on Craigslist and sell it for like 50 bucks. <laughs>
<laughs> but like right there is the sweet spot. As long as it never has to go any farther than that. Is that belt? I think that black dust is from the belt. <laughs> yeah, I think that's rubber from the belt. Oh yeah, that's what it's gotta be. That's, that's not good. The belt still looks fine. Oh jeez. <laughs> oh jeez. Uh, Don't tell them that uh, we're not replacing the belt. As far as I know, we're <laughs> replacing the belt. Uh, yeah, when it all goes back together, it will have a new belt. Sure. Wait, no, you know what the real problem was? One of those f***ing chicklets of gum probably got it. No, there. that's not possible. So we'll just set the old alternator aside, and we'll get ready to install our organically grown junkyard alternator. And as with most things, installation is the reverse of removal. We'll finagle it back into its little pocket of the engine bay, line up the voltage regulator with the studs, and get the regulator's four attaching nuts reinstalled. I had Rob do the final tightening pass on the smaller ones just in case something broke, it wouldn't be my fault. I admit, I do tend to over tighten things now and then. But anyway, everything is back together, so we just have to slide the alternator back into its brackets. Good as new. Can I do the top one first? No, you don't need the bolts. You're probably right. <laughs> then we'll reinstall the top through bolt and its nut. You want to anti-seize that or just leave them? Do you want anti-seize? Nah. That way I'll never have to worry about this thing moving. Come on. It's probably not lined up 100%. Oh, it's probably well, it's in the one side. It's lined up now? No, obviously not. I didn't think of that. <laughs> That did not occur to me. <laughs> and while we're at it, we'll also reinstall the large feed wire. Chrysler, in their infinite wisdom, decided not to make this one red, but you'll still have to make sure it's where it needs to be and not close enough to anything else it could short out on. Then we'll tighten that back up, and we'll reinstall the bottom two bolts, tighten them up, and then tighten down the top through bolt. And with that, the alternator is firmly attached. So we'll get to work reinstalling the fan. With it slid back onto its studs, we'll get everything down finger tight. Then once again, we'll hold it in place with the large flathead screwdriver and tighten them down. It's definitely awkward and time consuming and exposes you to all those sharp fan blades, but it will get the job done. It would be a good idea to use some blue Loctite on these, but there wasn't any on hand, so we'll just have to let Mother Nature's rust take care of it. And with those nice and tight, we'll reinstall the serpentine belt onto all of the pulleys. And we'll double check everything to make sure it's routed the right way around. With a multi-rib belt like this, the smooth side will just about always ride on the smooth pulleys, and the grooved side will just about always ride on the grooved pulleys. And with that back in place, we'll go ahead and tighten down this bolt to put tension on it. Tightening down a manual tensioner like this isn't an exact science. Well, at least it's not when we're doing it. But if you really want to get the tension just right, there's often information online about how much flex the belt should have at its longest run. What I will generally go by is how much force it takes to twist the belt 90 degrees sideways. Generally, on its longest run, if you have to really try to get it past 90 degrees, it's probably tight enough. What you definitely don't want to do is over-tighten it. Then there's too much stress on all the accessory bearings and the crankshaft, and that's not what we want. If it's a little too loose, you should be able to hear it squealing, or maybe your alternator voltage won't be ideal, and then you could just go and tighten it down a bit more. Once we found a setting we were comfortable with, we went ahead and tightened down the tensioner bolt. It was pretty hard to get anything but a short wrench on there, so I just got it as tight as I could. And there you go. Now all we have to do is reinstall the battery tray and the battery. That is, once Rob finishes christening the new alternator with all this dust. And while he reinstalled the battery tray, I tried to work out a way to zip tie this coolant overflow hose to keep it away from the radiator fan. Previously, he had just been jamming the hood closed on it, and that worked well enough, but it certainly isn't ideal. To reinstall the battery tray, Rob reconnected the battery temperature sensor, and then threaded on the three nuts. And he'll just carefully tighten those down using the impact gun. Then we get to play the socket retrieval game again. Battery tray to fan. 
And with that pesky socket out of the way, we can finally reinstall the battery. Ow. Cut. <laughs> we'll reconnect the battery cables and tighten them down. Yay. Since the universal aftermarket one we had installed had already broken apart, we discussed some different options for a battery hold down. A factory one would be ideal, but we don't have that on hand. So instead of having nothing, I decided we'll just try to lock it in place with the ratchet strap. But before we do that, I was still pretty concerned about this coolant overflow hose. I might still be a little bit scarred from my personal experience with the radiator hose hitting the alternator on the blazer. We couldn't figure out a good way to hold down the center of the hose, and Rob isn't terribly precious about the Jeep, so we just went ahead and drilled a hole to use a zip tie. And to keep the bare steel from rusting, we'll give it a nice touch up with some nail polish. This one we just temporarily borrowed. It will be fun. As long as she never watches these videos. Uh, Doesn't she? Yep. All the time. Well, it's, it's certainly yep. fashionable now. What color was that? Stranger Things. This Jeep's been through a lot, and it deserves some prettying up. And we'll give that nail polish a little bit of time to dry. We'll do whatever all this is and get the battery ratchet strapped down to the tray. It was uh, more difficult than it should have been. I can just bent the battery tray so it's pretty tight. <laughs> and now that the nail polish is dry, we can use a zip tie to really secure that coolant overflow hose. And, well, what's left to do but start the Jeep up? Go for it. It started right away, and not only was the accessory system turning freely, but it was charging the battery. Everything sounds good, and the voltage gauge looks good, so I think we're in business. And now that that work is done, we decided to go take it for a test drive. I had never actually heard the Jeep stumble, and I wanted to hear it for myself and try to get it on video. Plus, we just wanted to screw around a little bit. <laughs> yeah, the windshield is awful. Mm, <laughs> the lights are awful. And at some point, Rob had the genius idea to turn on the windshield wipers. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> mm. <laughs> <laughs> you made it so much worse. It's definitely an experience driving the Jeep around. It's got a lot of character and still barely has an exhaust system. It seemed to be doing really well, but the engine stumble would mostly occur at higher RPMs, so we hit the open road. And in the interest of seeing what would happen, Rob gave it some gas. And now that the Jeep was warmed up, it seemed like it would pretty much stumble like that on demand. Below 2000 RPM, it really didn't seem to have any issues at all, but above that, it would start to get pretty weird. It reminded me quite a bit of the engine stumble I had a problem with in the Blazer when it turned out to be running out of fuel in the carburetor bowl. <laughs> There were a lot of comments with suggestions in the last video, and I think we tried to test pretty much all of them. I need to sort out the fuel pressure gauge so that we can install that and see exactly what's happening there. But in the meantime, there was one YouTube comment that pointed out an interesting detail. 
This Cherokee uses a fuel pressure regulator that's in the tank. I had no idea because when you search for parts, a regular one shows up that just mounts to the fuel rail. But that's not what this special little butterfly uses. Back in episode 2, when we replaced the fuel pump, this little section right above the pump in the sending assembly is actually the fuel pressure regulator. From the research I was able to do, this type of regulator lasted exactly one year. Near as I can tell, this type of regulator was only used in the 1996 Cherokee. Before, they used a fuel pressure regulator at the engine, and after, they switched back to that. And they also discontinued the parts for this in-tank regulator. Luckily, the aftermarket took to making them, and at least one company under a few different brand names has a part for that. But you have to replace the entire fuel sending assembly, and it's not cheap. Considering the condition of the gas tank, it would hardly be surprising if there was another problem in the fuel system back there. Also, the fuel level sender doesn't work, so the gas gauge is stuck on empty. And considering how... <laughs> crunchy it was when we removed it, I'm not sure it would be an easy thing to fix. A malfunctioning fuel pressure regulator could do some weird stuff, and hopefully it is the source of our problem, because we went ahead and got one of these fuel pressure sending assemblies. And, well, that's the next step. We'll drop the gas tank, clean it out, and install this new assembly. At the very least, it'll get that gas gauge working, and if we're lucky, maybe it'll fix that stumble too. 